Hi, we're here with Edward Allen, and so I'll let Edward introduce himself, please. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm the son and namesake of Edward Allen from Nunat Siavut. Um, I am Hablanaliuk, which is a, a Nutatut term, meaning somebody that has blended ancestry, um, Inuit and settler ancestry, who identifies with the Inuit of Nunat Siavut. Um, currently reside on the uh, ancestral homelands of the Beotuk people and um, right now I'm uh, working with the Aboriginal Resource Office uh, which gives me the unique opportunity to share what I've been learning over my lifetime about uh, Aboriginal peoples across Canada and especially here in the province. Thank you Edward and speaking of the Aboriginal people of Newfoundland and Labrador I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about uh, those people, what are Aboriginal people, how will you define them, and what are the different peoples that we found in this province? Sure, sure. Um, well, Aboriginal is an umbrella term and it refers to uh, people with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis ancestry. It's uh, largely a term that uh, uh, is used in the Canadian Constitution, um, 1982. Um, and because it's used in the Constitution, it has very important um, uh, legal implications. Um, but not everybody who identifies as First Nations, Inuit, or Métis uh, will identify as, as being Aboriginal. Um, in the Mun community, uh, you know, we've polled our students and uh, Aboriginal uh, uh, people here in the university, and they've uh, agreed that that's the term that they prefer. As a general rule, I, I, I tend to uh, ask and then use the term that people identify for themselves. Um, there is a huge amount of diversity under that umbrella term, Aboriginal. Um, in Canada alone, we have about 630 different nations that uh, can be classified under First Nations, Inuit and Métis. In, um, in the borders of what is now uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, we have six distinct populations, very distinct populations. Um, where I'm from, Nunat Siovut, is uh, Inuit territory. Um, Labrador Inuit number in about approximately 7,200 7, people uh, and a little less than 2,000 live in the Nunat Siovut area. Nunat Siovut is a, an institute term, means our beautiful land. And Inuit is uh, an Inuit term that means uh, people, and Inuit is, is the language that is spoken there. Um, just to the south of that, we have uh, uh, the southern Inuit in a territory called Nunatukavut. Um, Nunatukavut means our ancient land, and uh, there's approximately uh, 6,000 uh, people uh, represented by the Nunatukavut Community Council. Um, their traditional or ancestral homelands is mostly central and southern Labrador. So also in, uh, in Labrador we have a population of Innu and uh, Innu is um, an Innu uh, Amun term which is a the language they speak there meaning people and um, Natasinan is the, uh, the word that's used to refer to our ancestral homelands uh, in Inu Amun. And uh, that um, Labrador border uh, kind of separates, well it doesn't really separate, but it, uh, it's right in the middle of Natasinan, which is a, a huge tract of land that has 11 Inu communities. Um, there's two on the Labrador side of that, uh, that border. Um, and they are uh, Shahashit and Natwashish. Um, now in the island part of the province, we have a um, couple of Mi'kmaq populations. Um, one is the uh, Miapugik, um, and that uh, is a, a community that's located in southern central Newfoundland on the coast there. Miapugik actually means middle river uh, in Mi'kmaq. Um, they have about uh, 950 people living on reserve there. Um, 850 of them are uh, status members and another about 100 that are not status but still live on uh, reserve. Around the rest of the island we have Halapu um, and they 
um, tend to localize in about 67 different communities. They are a Mi'kmaq population. Halapu is actually a, um, a Mi'kmaq word for caribou. Um, and Mi'kmaq, like the other populations, is, is a word for people. Um, and last but definitely not least, um, Memorial University actually sits on the ancestral homeland of the Biotuk people. Now, you might hear that uh, word pronounced as Biotic, um, which is, is a typical English uh, pronunciation for it, but Biotuk were uh, uh, Algonquin-speaking people and they, um, they would have pronounced it Biotuk or Biotuk in some circles. And what Biotuk means? I do not know. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I would like to, that's interesting. Um, I think that uh, if I were to find some Algonquin speaking people, they might be able to clue us in on that. Um, Inu and Mi'kmaq are Algonquin speaking people, um, and they might have clues on, on what that actually translates to. Um, Edward, you mentioned the uh, Inu population that um, is separate, but not really separate, between Labrador and, I, uh, and Quebec, the, mm -hmm. the neighboring province. So is this community, the, the Inu, do they, among all the communities making the territory, do they communicate, do they trade among each other? How does that work? Between oh yeah, the there's, a lot of, there's a lot of solidarity um, within that territory, and you find people that uh, uh, travel quite a bit and, and visit different communities and, and um, you know, marry from other communities and whatnot. Um, interestingly enough, um, that border that separates uh, Labrador and Quebec is, is less significant to an Inu population than it would be, say, a mainstream Canadian population. That border actually came way after uh, the Inu had established in that area and, and uh, had claimed that area for their, uh, for their use. And you uh, told us about uh, the, uh, the Mi'kmaq that are on reserve that are in, in Newfoundland and Labrador is um, particular, I, I, I think, for this because there's only kind of one reserve or, that I'm aware mm -hmm. of. And can you tell us why is that so? So in Labrador, we have two reserves. Um, there are Inu reserves, the communities of uh, Shahashit and uh, Natwashish. Um, we have a huge population of Mi'kmaq peoples, up to about 23,000, uh, one of the biggest bands in, in Canada on the island portion of the province. But they often self-describe as being a landless band and that they have not any uh, reserve lands set aside for them. Uh, now, that may be a situation that changes in the future, but uh, as it, it exists today, they're not uh, recognized as reserves by the federal government. And uh, speaking of which, what are the challenges that um, the various um, Aboriginal people, the various groups you've uh, described to us are facing mm -hmm. um, today and what will be the challenges for the future? Mm -hmm. Well, there are very um, distinct challenges in different communities. And we have to appreciate the diversity among uh, these populations. Um, one of the more recent challenges that affects uh, the Inuit of Nunatsiavut, uh, the Inu of Nutasinan, and the uh, Inuit of Nunatukavut is uh, environmental contamination. Uh, a lot of these uh, uh, populations exist in northern communities um, and as a function of their proximity or lack of proximity, um, food costs and cost of living are astronomical compared to, say, here in St. John's, for example. Um, you know, you might expect to pay uh, quadruple uh, on any given item uh, that you find in a grocery store. Um, and this, you know, adds to the importance of subsistence hunting and uh, living off the land, as people have done for a thousand years there. Uh, but unfortunately, environmental contaminants um, make that near impossible. Um, and because you um, face contamination in the food chain, it really limits your options of what you can do for yourself and your family. And it forces people to uh, go back to the grocery store and have to pay those a astronomical prices just to, uh, just to feed their families. 
And what, what are the factors that cause environmental contamination? There multiple? Maybe? There is. Um, you know, just to name a few, um, you know, about 20 years ago, we, we received notice in the Nazi of it not to eat the organs of a caribou uh, because of PCBs that were trapped in lichen, which is a caribou's, uh, one of their food sources, found their way into their bodies and, and was filtered through their organs. And it reached a, a level to where that it was uh, toxic for human consumption. Um, also, uh, we have concerns about methylmercury poisoning. Uh, what happens when water floods the land um, methylmercury leaches out of trees and plant life, finds itself in, uh, in the water supply, a water supply that's inhabited by salmon uh, and other um, marine life that lives off of salmon. And, and um, unfortunately, that affects um, a number of different species of fish, uh, seal, um, even whale. Um, a lot of the traditional food sources, right? So it, um, it has gotten to a level where it's questionable if, if people should be eating that because we're talking about uh, methylmercury poisoning, we're talking about birth defects, we're talking about a number of very serious health concerns. So um, unfortunately, um, the way of life and subsistence hunting is being affected um, to the point where people are finding it difficult to uh, live in the communities. And one of the, I guess, one of the challenges that's associated with that is, is you'll find people leaving the communities to come to more urban areas. Um, and, you know, for a lot of people that might be just to go out and have some city life for a while. Uh, for a number of people, it is about being closer to programming, services, things that aren't available in their own communities. And uh, also, um, to add to what we were speaking about earlier, is, is about being able to provide for themselves uh, and their families. So coming to an area that's more resource rich, employment rates are better, and food costs are, are considerably lower. And is there any um, uh, land claims that are ongoing with the government um, mm -hmm. right now? Uh, what, 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 what's uh, the status of, of this for uh, Aboriginal people in the province? Uh, well, within the province, uh, Nunat Siovut has, uh, has um, finalized their land claims agreement and, uh, and assumed self-governance in 2005. And already, uh, I mean, the unfortunate reality is that in Canada, Aboriginal peoples are uh, overrepresented in many of the um, Areas that are, that constitute health concerns, um, uh, physical health, mental health, suicide rates, for example. But since 2005, we're already seeing a sharp decline in some of those statistics, um, which is amazing and, and I think uh, par for the course. Um, Nunatukovut uh, has. They do not have a, a comprehensive land claims agreement, although that may be in the works. Um, and that's something that uh, people could contact the uh, Nunatukovo Community Council to find out more information. Um, the Innu communities have established reserves, um, as, as does uh, Khan River. Um, the Halapu Mi'kmaq, um, they as we spoke of earlier, do not have a, um, a land claims agreement so far, but they do identify 67 different communities in which are designated uh, Halapu communities. Uh, I'm not sure what direction that would uh, go in from here, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, as they become established and, and um, um, overcome some of the recent membership concerns that uh, that might be a direction they pursue. And um, in order to, for non-Aboriginal people, or people that don't identify as Aboriginal, to help Aboriginal people, um, uh, you know, through the reconciliation process, you know, after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and through uh, building more bridges between the, the mm -hmm. two communities, what, what are some advices that you 
could give non-Aboriginal um, uh, about how to help you or support you in um, this, this process of recognition. Mm. I think the, um, the first step is um, to take responsibility for our own education on, on these matters. There's a, there's a huge lack of awareness um, that contributes to um, the negativity that, um, that reconciliation is trying to overcome with regards to the relationship between Aboriginal peoples and, and uh, settler Canadians. Um, you know, this, is, this might be partly responsible to the lack of representation in the school system for um, Aboriginal themes, histories, topics. Um, I would suspect that it's largely due to how the media portrays uh, Aboriginal peoples. Um, unfortunately, we hear really grave things coming out of the communities, but 99.9% .9 of the situation is actually amazing stories of resilience, of, of community, of happiness that, don't, that doesn't really get captured in the media's portrayal. Uh, I think that uh, once we have a foundational understanding, uh, then, we can, then we can participate in more informed discussions about moving forward. Um, but unfortunately, as it, as it is, you know, uh, the typical um, mainstream Canadian understanding doesn't differentiate between groups like Inuit and Innu, for example. You know, many people make the mistake to lump all Aboriginal peoples into the same group. Um, so if you, can, if you can have that foundational understanding that, uh, that um, keeps you cognizant of the diversity, I think that's a big thing. Um, when, once you do have that understanding, I think that uh, it's about acting as an ally. And uh, an ally isn't necessarily a, a, a role, but it's a, a type of behavior. Um, acting al as an ally doesn't mean that you interject what you think might be useful for a people. It means that you um, support what their goals are. So, um, for example, if I were to show up in an Aboriginal community, anyone in Canada, and say, oh, well, you know, things would be better if you did this, this, and this, um, that uh, often has negative um, and often devastating uh, consequences. But if I were to, to show up in a community, uh, learn about the community, uh, respect what's going on in the community, and then help community members reach their goals, then that, that is true allyship, and that uh, has been the most successful method um, so far with regards to non-Aboriginal peoples uh, acting as allies. Uh, you know, when we're talking about acting as allies, it's, it's, it's about our shared value systems, and, and it's about acting in a way that respects people. Um, and, you know, there, there are a few uh, um, uh, tips that I can offer. I mean, and a lot of it has to do with critical thinking. Um, you know, and, and the change needs to happen in our conversations because when we, when we talk about the, these, um, when we talk about the relationship between Aboriginal peoples and non-Aboriginal peoples, we need to do it in a positive way. We need to do it with good attitudes, with respect. Um, and we need not... Uh, generalize or discriminate uh, because we unfortunately will limit our understanding of what the situation is if we do so. So a little critical thinking goes a long way. I, I tend to avoid conversations where you know people refer to well all of people A are like this. You know it's sometimes even if I don't know anything about a, a particular group of people I can tell the information coming in, if that is, uh, if that's based on reason, or if it's based on opinion, or if it comes from a bad attitude, I think if we can discuss these things with uh, some awareness and with good attitudes, that will go a long way to repair the relationship. Um, any final words for us before we end this discussion? 
I think that um, it's unfortunate that the, the relationship between Aboriginal peoples and settler Canadians hasn't been more positive. There was a, was a time in history where it was very positive, uh, but it took a, a downturn, unfortunately, uh, with a number of different uh, significant uh, historical events. Um, I think that when the relationship is repaired, all Canadians are going to benefit from that. Um, not just Aboriginal peoples, but Aboriginal peoples, cultures, knowledge systems, um, they have an additive effect on our, um, our understanding, our um, ways of doing things, our um, wellness practices. Um, there's a lot that uh, can be shared if we enter into a respectful uh, relationship. All right. Well, thank you so much, Edward, for your time. Yeah.